Let's get insights from two of the sharpest minds in the banking world here in Asia. Piyush Gupta a CEO of DBS Bank, the largest lender in Southeast Asia. Piyush has been credited with transforming DBS into a leader in digital finance. He was named one of the world's top 100 best performing CEOs in the Harvard Business Review. Piyush, always good to have you with us. And we also have Philip Gori. He's Debbie Morgan, Asia Pacific CEO, a veteran banker with a 20 year career at the bank. Filippo has served as chairman of the Asia Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association since September 2018 and as a board member since 2014. Filippo, good to have you with us, gentlemen. Thank you. Now, one of the, one of the biggest changes arising from uh, the virus is the digital shift. Some say, what would have taken eight years to just eight weeks? Piyush, perhaps we can start with you. What's been the key changes you've seen in banking? What's been transformed? Um, Haslinda, it's uh, good to be on uh, uh, the show with you uh, as usual. But uh, so I have a slightly uh, different view. I think uh, the transition to digital has been occurring a pace over the past several years. Uh, for us, we started digitizing both our internal and external uh, business uh, capabilities several years ago. And I was just reflecting, um, in 2015, about 30 odd percent of our customers were engaging with us primarily digitally. Um, by last year, that number was already up to about 53%. So this has been a gradual shift. Now, it is true that in the last couple of months, you've seen an acceleration of that shift. And the acceleration of the shift means that a lot of the people who were recalcitrant I didn't have a choice. And frankly, that included a lot of older people. I found that uh, people between 60 and 80 uh, saw a four-fold increase in terms of using digital tools in the last couple of months. It's not a large number, it's in the thousands. But nevertheless, you're beginning to see the naysayers and the more recalcitrant people also uh, getting online. So that's been one. Uh, the second actually has been uh, more to do with the bank's uh, capabilities. So even though we had a really good set of digital tools, the COVID showed us that we still had some gaps, uh, what I call missing bridges. And therefore you found some obscure reason why the customer would still not be able to fulfill the transaction online and would have had to reach out to the bank. And so uh, we really accelerated building those bridges to complete this last mile capability. But perhaps most important and for everybody, uh, where this was really eye-opening was in the internal capability or our employees' ability to work from anywhere. Uh, that, of course, has been a game-changer for everybody around the world. And I think that's been driven by both changes in the risk appetite of companies. We'd be willing to do things we might not normally have been willing to do, but perhaps also in the psychology of companies. A lot of managers, middle managers, senior managers, would normally have been very reluctant to let people work from home, even if you had official policies which let you do that. And that shift in the psychology of people has been profound. The recognition today that, you know, 90% of the people could safely work from home and do it over extended periods of time. I think that is really what's going to be the long-term uh, game changer. I think that shift will uh, lead to a lot more flexible working arrangements than we've seen in the past. Uh, Philippe, let's bring you into this discussion. From JP Morgan's perspective, what are some of the changes you've seen and, and how permanent are these changes? Uh, thank you very much, Aslinda. It's a pleasure to be here uh, together with Piyush. I would echo some of the things that Piyush have just said. I think some of these changes were already in the making a few years back. Huh? And the digitalization and the virtualization of our banking business was already in the making. What COVID, though, has provided has been an incubator which has accelerated some of those trends and made them, uh, uh, and made them faster and, and made us, us reacting faster to some of the uh, challenges that we were facing externally. Now, um, how much of these will, will become permanent? Uh, remember that JP Morgan in Asia Pacific is only has only wholesale business, so no no retail component. In my humble opinion, the longer the virus remains, the more prolonged the lockdowns and so on and so forth, the more some of those uh, changes that we have implemented will become uh, quasi permanent. Uh, 
Um, on the other hand, um, some, if, 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 for, if we had the magic wand and the virus could be eliminated tomorrow, I think there would be uh, still, we would go back to some of the old, uh, the old way of doing business. In that sense, um, we are observing, we are still learning. I think it's a little bit too early to say for us how, we, how this will change our way of operating in the region. For sure, we will keep on in investing in the 17 countries in which, we are, in which we are present, also because the lack of traveling uh, kind of require you to be, have an, a bigger onshore presence. But for more um, profound lessons learning, I think we, it's, it's, it's just a little bit too early to say. Uh, the reason so I asked is because one on report. Go ahead. So if I could comment on that, as I was going to say. So I think what's happened in the last couple of months is pretty much an extreme. The pendulum swung massively because you didn't have choices and options. Uh, I think, uh, without a doubt, uh, as things people start getting reconciled to uh, this reality, the pendulum will swing back somewhat. I don't think it will go all the way back. Now, to take one good uh, case point, when demonetization happened in India, and Modi discontinued all the currencies, for the next several weeks, you didn't have a choice. You could only go and use a mobile payment instrument, and everybody said everything's going to go digital and mobile. A uh, few months down the road, uh, the degree of mobile use was up from historical levels, but it moderated down from the peaks. And I think you will see some element of that over here. So for the, in our case, for example, uh, in many of our countries, we have 80% plus of our people work from home through this two-month period. There is no way that I expect to run with 80% of people working from home in perpetuity. Uh, I do think you'll have more flexible working and therefore more people have the options and choices to work from home. But I think for both long-term productivity, for uh, employee morale, for psychology and for culture reasons, uh, it would be completely impractical to continue working like this forever. So I do think that you will see a correction and a shift at a level which is higher than the traditional levels, but not as extreme as what we've seen in the last couple of months. Yeah, and as uh, Linda, if I can just say, I can just say what, what, what Piyush was saying to conclude his thoughts. I think there is also an element of human interaction in the banking business, which underpins our our business and therefore i think employees to a certain extent you know withstanding their con the concern for their health are also craving that element of human interaction so there will be some sort of normalization within the parameters of what of what uh, pius just described one of the issues or one of the changes would be in the payments behavior, I suppose. I mean, Visa has come out to say that contactless payments are soaring. And uh, the question is really, have behaviors really changed uh, to that end? Are we any closer to cash uh, being eradicated, Piyush? Well, cash has been uh, rapidly declining again over several years. For the last four years, our total uses of cash. By COVID well, it has to have been because partly you don't know. Fewer people have been going out, and therefore overall consumption has been down, and therefore it's hard to say whether uh, the de decline in cash is just because people weren't in the markets and the stores, and everybody was doing online shopping. So when you do online shopping, obviously you don't use cash. Once you go back into the physical world, you know how much cash you use is still not entirely uh, clear. But I think directionally, cash has been coming off. Our own cash has been down by 5 to 7% a year now for the last four or five years. So that's without a doubt. There is less cash. I think the alternative payment types are also proliferating. Uh, in, in addition to just plastic debit and credit, uh, you're seeing every kind of e-wallet and every kind of online real-time payment tool being made available to customers. Many of them are very convenient. So customers are taken to them uh, in large measure. So I do think that trend will continue um, for uh, uh, the immediate future. Some of it can get further uh, accelerated if you really wind up with some central bank digital currencies. Now, that is effectively uh, central bank-backed money, but it's in electronic form. So I think that could further accelerate the 
the prospects. Uh, China is already experimenting with that in Suzhou and a couple of uh, other places. However, and this is an important however, um, you know, in uh, Scandinavia, which obviously saw the demise of cash faster than anywhere else, uh, there is a strong holdout of people who still want to use cash to the extent that the legislature has had to start looking for rules and putting in rules that prohibit banks from shutting down any more ATMs and shutting down any more branches to be able to cater to this long tail. Uh, similarly, I, I read a survey folks in Switzerland are very concerned about not having currency because obviously currency has got one dramatic positive and that is anonymity. Once you use cash, nobody can see what you spent it on. And in countries and uh, situations where people value privacy, uh, they want to use cash as opposed to leave an electronic uh, trail every time they go and make an expenditure. So I think you might eventually wind up uh, with a situation where you never have zero cash. But I do think you will have less cash in the future than you have today. Philippe? Yes, I agree that the trend is there and it's clearly uh, incredibly present in, in Asia Pacific. If you think about countries like Australia, where the digitalization of the banking business, it, it's been, uh, it's been uh, at the forefront. Uh, or if you think about what's happening in Singapore, what's happening in China. Uh, in the rest of the world, I mean, being European, uh, we still love cash. And, and mentally, it's been difficult to, to move away from that. And the same way, if you look at the US, cash is still there. The same way credit cards have never really been replaced fully, even when we try with some digital offering outside, uh, outside of Asia. So Asia, I would say, in that sense, is leading the charge in the digitalization of the banking business. And I think I agree with Piyush, the rest of the world will follow, but there are some cultural considerations for which um, there might be a delay in the in this in, in a cashless society in that sense uh, um, to be upon us uh, uh, because I believe in certain countries, European ones and in the US, uh, cash still plays a dominant role. And for to <laughs> give you some, some of this. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, Sorry, I, I think, just... Philip, if we, don't need, if we don't need Haslinda, I think we're monopolizing her time. Yeah, sorry, you're right. Haslinda, <laughs> please go ahead. Okay, we'll go, we'll go to Piyush, then we go to Filippo, and then I'll have a question. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say that, you know, I think some of this is indeed cultural, but not entirely. Uh, as I was reflecting, the best example of elimination of cash is Europe, actually, because it's all over Scandinavia. So you go to Sweden, Denmark, Finland, including the Netherlands, uh, there is no cash. And so you could argue it might be differences by country and not by uh, continent. But I think one of the big enablers is the underlying infrastructure. So the places where either private sector, Alibaba, uh, WeChat in China, or the public sector, the the Aadhaar based, uh, you know, the payment UPI payment system in India or the pay now infrastructure in Singapore, uh, where the infrastructure has been invested in, which makes it uh, effortless and seamless and makes the customer journey very, very easy. Uh, people start taking up these alternative payment tools a lot more readily. Uh, the country where the infrastructure does not exist and there's a lot of friction, then people tend to uh, stick with cash longer. Philippe? Yeah, I, um, I agree. Um, the Southern European countries where I come from are probably in the in the latter category. Uh, having said this, the point I was the final point I was trying to make is, as a firm, to give an idea, we still move uh, around six trillion dollar of cash every day in payments across the globe, and actually during the crisis, that those amounts have actually increased dramatically to normalize back again now. But the, we are still moving a huge amount of cash across the world. There is a question here from a participant and that like your view on how some banks are cutting or reducing dividends during the pandemic. Your thoughts on that? I mean, we've seen that uh, in even uh, in Thailand, where the BOT just yesterday uh, said exactly that. What are, what are your thoughts on that, Filippo? 
Uh, I think it's for the board of JP Morgan and uh, for the US regulator to, to opine on. <laughs> go, go ahead. Piyush, go ahead. <laughs> I can't pass it on to the board of JP Morgan, so I guess I have to feel that one. Uh, but uh, okay, I so we have both. Mm -hmm. If you if you if you think about uh, all the uh, provisions and the bank strengthening done post 09, uh, it was fairly it led to fairly robust levels of capital, uh, and it also led to a protocol. Uh, which said that you first exhaust your capital and other buffers, then you dip into counter-cyclical buffers, and after you get through counter-cyclical buffers, if you get to lower levels of point, point of non-viability, you bail in your tier one, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it also set up some rules that when you dip into counter-cyclical buffers, that's when you're not allowed to pay dividend, and that's when you're not allowed to pay bonuses. So we set up a whole protocol as a industry to guide us on how to deal with and work our way through these kinds of uh, situations. Now, if you look at the, um, the, the, the thinking around dividends, uh, it's actually been quite bifurcated. Uh, most of the European regulators took the view that even though the stress in the system is not visible right now, the banking system is not visible right now, the future prospects are so dire that it makes sense to discard the protocol we set up and push banks to start preserving capital right away by cutting back on dividends. Uh, some of the regulators in Asia, the Australians as well, went down that path. However, other regulators, the Americans were uh, a good case point, but other regulators in the region as well, took the view that we should actually let the protocol work. And if the banks in the banking system demonstrate both through their stress test and the ICAP capabilities that they appear to have the capacity to be able to handle the crisis without actually having to cut back on dividends, then that's probably fine. Uh, so there were two different points of view. Uh, I, my own view on this was uh, at some point in the future, if it turns out that the crisis is a, much, is a lot worse than people have predicted or the losses are going to be so dire that you will have to get below capital flows, then that would be the appropriate time to start rethinking dividend policies as opposed to do it way ahead of time. But it's a, you know, I mean, I don't have a strong view on that. I can understand why some regulators might take a more conservative stance uh, as well. Filippo, uh, this one's for you. We've been talking about the rising US-China tensions. Uh, given that situation, Will you have to walk on eggshells? How will JP Morgan make big inroads into a country at such a time? Look, the strategy that we had to invest in the region um, and the 17 countries of the region, not only in China, but also in Japan, Australia, or Southeast Asia for that matter, or India, has been, uh, it was a, it was a strategy that was defined by the board a few years back, because this is, is, a, is a vibrant region and it is considered the region where the most interesting opportunities for growth for the firm uh, are, are, are appearing. In that sense, uh, investing in China and having a large onshore presence was, was defined back already five years or so ago. Um, we have to remember that JP Morgan has been in China since 1921. We are preparing our centenary anniversary for next year. And our strategy has been to be there to help both the international clients and the Chinese clients who need our help, especially when it comes to cross-border situation. And in the last few years, the, the flows, both inbound and outbound, that we have seen coming from China have been particularly remarkable. So notwithstanding the geopolitical uncertainties, our strategy uh, for the time being remains the same, which is keep on investing um, keep up uh, in the country and in helping our customer and clients in what they are their business needs. And uh, and we just got given last, last week uh, another license, and hopefully we will complete all of those in time for the for the centenary next year. That's right. JP Morgan was approved to fully own the Chinese futures unit. Uh, what are the priorities for the first two years? You think? So the, the priority for us is very simple. Uh, owning um, 
100% of the FNO company arriving at owning 100% of the security company. Uh, we're working already towards owning 100% of the asset management company, and we already have a bank, the China Local Incorporated Bank. So arriving with this full set of, uh, of licenses and starting de deploying them, we have doubled our headcount over the last six years onshore in China, and then starting serving more and more clients. As I said, in both inbound and unbound capacity, that's that's our priority. Uh, this one's for you, Piyush. Uh, you're big on digital payments. Wirecard has become a big player in digital payments uh, in Singapore, as well as the rest of Asia as a whole. Uh, do you see consumers and companies' confidence in Wirecard shaking, uh, given the extent of missing money and up scandals? Is, is that an issue? Well, I think that it's hard for me to comment on how people might feel about Wirecard in particular. Uh, but it logically stands to reason that every time any company, why card anybody else, gets this degree of public scrutiny and negative uh, uh, PR, uh, it does make people angry. So that has to be the case. Uh, I think why cards, uh, big propositions actually uh, also as a merchant, as a merchant acquirer. So there could also be a degree of nervousness and other merchants to use them as a gateway. Uh, and that is uh, not Im impossible. Now, if you ask me the, the broader question, does the challenges of do the challenges of Wirecard uh, start spilling over to lack of confidence with other players in the e-payments or the electronic industry? I think the answer is probably no. I think there's a. Uh, I mean, you'll always find uh, challenges and individual idiosyncratic problems in uh, any industry, and Wirecard is likely to be one of those. I don't think they really reflect overall on e-payments or the industry in particular. So I don't see that having a significant impact on confidence in general on the e-payment regime or the infrastructure um, across the board. We only have a couple of minutes left, and I just want to throw this question to both of you. We talked a lot on our shows about the disconnect between markets and economy. How do you view that disconnect? Have markets reacted the way you anticipated? Has it been rational, irrational? Have some of to encourage risky behaviors in the markets? And, you know, does it make you nervous? Let's start with Philippa. I, I think Mary Erdos said it very well uh, early, earlier this morning on, on your show when uh, she runs our private wealth management, private bank and asset management. Uh, she said, um, markets are not emotional, investors are. So, um, I think there is an element of emotions running uh, uh, across the investors community. Uh, at times is re reacting to the geopolitical headlines, at times is um, uh, reacting to the government, uh, what the government are trying to do. My personal view, the government has, are trying to help um, the economies uh, getting back uh, on their feet and, and they've done well in doing it um, exceptionally fast. Having said this, um, it is a long process, and I don't think we have yet uh, seen the end uh, of, of this crisis, and therefore it's a bit too early to see uh, how the markets will go from here. There is a lot of emotions running, running wild, and there's a lot of discrepancies and dichotomies across various financial markets, as your previous speaker was, was just mentioning earlier on. Yours, if I could have your perspective. No, my perspective is actually quite similar. I do think that there is a dislocation between the real economy and the markets. Uh, I think that the amount of stress uh, we will see in the real economy uh, is going to be huge. Uh, unemployment is one indicator of it. Uh, PPIs, uh, consumption patterns, GDP rates, trade flows, everything suggests that the recovery is going to be long drawn out. Uh, including, by the way, in China, I don't necessarily agree with China that this V-shaped recovery uh, is going to persist because at the end of the day, China needs demand from the rest of the world as well. So I do think the world is in for an extended period of slow growth. And when that happens, it's hard to justify uh, strong corporate earnings. And if you don't have strong corporate earnings, then it's hard to justify markets continuing to rise forever. So this is really, to a large extent, a liquidity-driven boom. There's a lot of money at work. It's also interesting that certainly in the U.S. market, a lot of this is retail money. Uh, it is that 
proverbial auntie who's buying the day porter noise of the twitter trade uh, all the intelligent money is frankly missed out on the bull run because they were looking at the fundamentals but i think uh, i i'm also a value investor i think fundamentals matter and therefore there's every likelihood uh, that you will see a correction somewhere along the line to bring the financial markets more in line with the real sector a uh, longer term i do think there are areas of opportunity and i do think that digital economy and some of the shifts in behavior that we are seeing uh, will create opportunities and for tech companies digital companies etc uh, but i do think there is a dislocation right now thank you philippe great conversation hopefully next time we'll do it in person thank you so much